Proper Madness, formerly Beautifully Broken. My name is Savvy and I give a unique perspective on mental health by providing tools, guidance, and knowledge on how we can better understand ourselves as well as our past and present experiences and in doing so, we can help heal our mental health. I get to speak with a variety of individuals from around the world as they share their stories from their journey through their mental wellness so that it helps others stand strong and use their voice. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone, to Proper Madness. Today, I have the honor of sitting down with Joe. I reached out to him on Instagram. I found his post on body dysmorphia resonated with me, but here he is. I'll let him introduce himself to you. Hi, everybody. My name is Joe. Uh, I am a business owner. I own a chain of gyms, functional training gyms in Turkey. Indonesia. I'm very selective of who I choose to to come on to here. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like if they're if I catch that they're very authentic to who they are and there's not a glimpse of you know that fake persona online, that's who mm -hmm. I tend to call on. I just I love hearing the stories of real people because that's what. So yeah, how do you find the difference between the two? You know, like mm -hmm. I feel like for most people or at least for me, I have a really difficult time with telling whether something is authentic or not. I mean, you can get a vibe, right? Yeah. You can get a feeling of whether or not something is authentic or not. But I wonder how is it that you do it? And how do you feel if somebody is authentic or isn't? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, for me, I'm, I'm a very spiritual person. So for me, it's about maybe 80% gut instinct and intuition. Mm -hmm. And the other 20 is just based off my own experiences. And you can kind of tell when people aren't being themselves. It's, it's a lot of mm -hmm. small talk. Um, they don't have deep personal conversations with you. They don't, they ask you how your day is, but that's just, sure. like, that's just really it. And there's no depth. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's probably one of the things that I've had the hardest time with is having small talk with people. I don't have any problems with having deep conversations just because that's the thing that interests me. So if it's something that interests me, then I have, it's easier for me to be present in the conversation, if that makes sense. No, you know? 100%. Yeah. If someone's giving me small talk, I get bored quick. I'm like, okay, well, next thing, move on. Like, I just mm -hmm. want to get to the point. So I guess the interest for you in, in doing this podcast about mental health is because you've had things with your mental health that you've been working on as well, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I had P or not anymore, really. I overcame PTSD, depression, and anxiety. Mm -hmm. My biggest recent hurdle was body dysmorphia. Fitness is something I threw myself into because of mental health. And then right. it just became a very slippery slope with feeling good mentally. And then all of a sudden the physical was nice. I was like, oh, I feel good about myself. Sure. But then there's so many nasty like fitness myths that linger all across the internet this just this mentality of perfection which for me is mind-blowing you know so I mm. started taking a step back and going okay I'm getting a little too picky with what I'm eating I'm not living right. a balanced life um mm. I wasn't enjoying working out anymore I love lifting weights and just you know hitting new PRs and doing all those things I just I stopped I stopped doing that right so. so do you feel like when you first started training, then you, um, it was helpful for your mental health and it kind of got to a point where you started becoming obsessed with training and yeah. it started to become unhealthy? A hundred percent. Yeah. So where are you at now? Like at this point? I would say time, now finally hit a healthier point. Um, mm -hmm. For the first time in a couple of years, I was in a good place for a while. And then I don't know what happened. I think someone said mm -hmm. something to me and just kind of stayed in there for a while and right yeah eats away yeah yeah I think that's one of the one of the things for people in the fitness industry for sure or anybody who's in fitness right whether they're an influencer or somebody who's just a, a hobbyist who just likes to train or somebody yeah. who is a, a fitness trainer or a fitness professional I think a lot of people have um, some form of body body dysmorphia you know, whether it's something that they've already gotten over 
and is what started them into fitness or if it's something that they've developed while uh, training. Mm -hmm. I think to some extent, everybody has that. And I think that's something that I'm still trying to find a balance in for myself mm -hmm. because there's a real fine line, I feel, between uh, loving yourself enough as you are and being accepting of who you are as a person uh, and then hating yourself enough to be able to make the changes that you need to make, yeah. you know? Because I feel like there's a lot of, there's a lot of a certain attitude now where everything is very accepting and everything is very twisted in a way where it's good to be fat. It's good to be unhealthy, right? Mm. And I think a lot of people's value comes in this idea that you have to look a certain way or you have to be a certain way to be accepted. I don't know. I think for me, that's the, the, the most difficult thing that I have to face is how do I find the balance between loving and accepting myself for who I am mm -hmm. and then being willing to put in the hard work to actually change and be better, you know? Yeah. How did, so with your journey with working out for you, was it, did you start working out because you want to look a certain way or as you started, then you developed more body dysmorphia? What was that like for you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that I've ever really thought about it too hard, but I know that when I first started training, the desire, the, the reason why I started training in the first place was I was very, very underweight. I was a very skinny kid and very underdeveloped. So I remember the very first experience that I had with training, my first motivation to train was when I was about nine. Um, I had friends who were a lot older, so around 15. So obviously they'd already hit puberty. They already started growing. They were already starting to exercise. And there I was just a skinny little kid. Um, so obviously I wanted to try to fit in. I wanted to be like them. And I was always active growing up. So playing uh, soccer, as you guys call it, football. So, you know, that was something that was always a part of my life. I was always active. I was always relatively fit and healthy. But I was never big. I was always kind of undersized. And so for me, the biggest motivation to train was because I wanted to fit in with the, with the older kids, fit in mm -hmm. with the big kids, you know, the cool kids. So that was my original motivation. And then from there, it was just a struggle because under eating, not because of uh, any sort of real desire to diet, but just because of a, a lack of availability of, of good, healthy food. So yeah. for me, I was just always small all the way through till I was at about 15 or so, just always very underweight and very lean so it, there was always this kind of image in my mind where I wanted to get big and I wanted to get strong but I was never really able to do it no matter how much work or effort I was able to put in so I think that's probably where it started but then for me I think the biggest issue with body dysmorphia came a lot later where I thought I looked good so let me back back a little bit I've been training pretty much since I was like nine right mm -hmm. so when I started body weight exercises, push-ups, pull-ups, that sort of thing. And yeah. then kind of getting older and 15 or so, then you're starting to lift a little bit more weight. And then, you know, I still stayed active and played a lot of sports. And it was about when I was 22 or so, I'd say. I was starting to lift a lot more weight with not great form, you know, mm -hmm. but working out in the gym, kind of bro, bro down sort of training, yeah. uh, doing a lot of bodybuilding style. And I got to the point where I felt like I was really jacked, you know? I looked at myself, I'm like, yeah, I'm really happy with the way I look. And then the issue is that, you know, fast forward a couple of years from then, and then you look back at pictures and you're like, wow, I realized that looking at where I'm at right now, looking back at where I was before, I used to think that I was super jacked and I can look at myself now and realize that I really wasn't comparatively mm -hmm. speaking. Yeah. So that kind of built this whole, this whole feeling where now I'm not the skinny kid who's trying to get big and that type of body dysmorphia, but now it's shifted to the point where I'm looking at myself. And even though now I feel like I'm in relatively good shape, mm -hmm. I always had at the back of my mind is what if I look at myself three years from now and I realize that I was not as fit as I thought I was. So now it's kind of that, that, that feeling of uncertainty where you look at yourself in the mirror and you like what you see, everything's mm -hmm. perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with you, so to, so to speak, but you're always kind of in the back of your mind wondering whether or not you're going to look back at this later on and realize that this was not at all what you were looking for. Yeah. Does that no, make I sense? No, hundred percent. It's actually eerie that you say that. Cause I, I today talked about something similar um, where I saw I looked good. My journey was a little mm -hmm. different. I was heavier 
but I wasn't being healthy at all. And I did a lot. Mm -hmm. My past is crazy. I did a lot of drugs. I had like substance abuse problems. Uh, But my weight was always yo-yoing, you know, because when you you do that stuff, you're looking for quick fixes and that doesn't, Mm -hmm. your metabolism just gets shot. So uh, I got into fitness for that reason to feel better about myself physically. And I got to a point where I got really lean, like just, I was, I looked really good and I really liked it. But then same thing, a few years went by and I looked back at those pictures and I went, wait a second. I didn't look as good as I thought I did, that my reality was warped. The fact that mm-hmm. I thought I looked good, but then I was like, well, hang on, I look even better now. This is weird. But it, I right. mean, it went back and forth. It was still even, I couldn't see myself of like how much I had improved either. So that messed with me. Like I couldn't mm-hmm. see it in, in uh, real time. And yeah. it just kept going and going and going. And it, yeah. Yeah, for sure. But I think that's that's pretty much universal for everybody. I mean, people who have eating disorders and people who have body image issues, when you're in the moment, it's really hard for you to be an objective judge of yourself. Yeah. Whether you are saying, hey, I look good now, or if you're saying, I, I, I'm not sure how exactly to put this into words, but if you look at, look at the way that you are right now, it's really a tough time to, for you to be able to assess the way that you look realistically yeah. and I think in hindsight it's a lot clearer but at the same time you only know what you know and so if in the future you've progressed further and you've gotten better and your body has changed and then you judge yourself before based on how you are now mm. I think that's also quite unfair to yourself yeah you know 100 percent 100 percent is there um what you mean I don't hear a lot of men talking about having body dysmorphia like this ever um do you feel like for men it's I mean just from a male perspective from what you've seen um do you think like there's a huge stigma behind men not talking about this at all from my experience no and that I don't think that I've ever experienced men not talking about these things you know I, I really only have a sample size of one for me. Like it's not something that I've talked about with my friends or my gym buddies, but it is always like the, the conversation always is something along the lines of how can you do better? Mm. Or I want to get a bigger chest or I want to build my back more, or, you know, my clean is not where I want it to be, or I would like to improve my bench press or whatever it is. There's always some sort yeah. of discussion about how you can do better. I think it's very rarely a discussion of celebrating your wins Mm. at least in my experience I've not really had a whole lot of practice with doing that for myself or even doing that for other people like my friends or gym partners you know it's it's not you don't really celebrate the wins as much in my experience and I think that's something that I'd like to change for myself so you can have milestones and you can celebrate the fact that you've actually put in work and done things to make yourself better yeah yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I don't, I don't think enough people talk about that. There's always um, like a, a never ending chase of I'll be happy when, or I'll be happy mm-hmm. if, and then once you get there and you kind of, you're still doing it, you know, it doesn't right. stop. But how much of that do you feel is necessary to be able to drive progress? Well, that's true. That is true. I feel like, I feel like a healthy amount is, you know, mm-hmm. but if you don't stop in the moment and be mindful of, okay, I got to where I am. Okay, cool. How can I improve now? But I feel right. like there has to be a happy medium. Um, I feel like, I feel largely there's just extremes. There's not, there's, it's very black and white. You know, there's mm-hmm. no gray with that. And I don't know why that's something that I think should change. Yeah. 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 That makes a lot of sense. And I think you're absolutely right. There has to be a balance, but I think that is the problem finding the balance, at least for me. I don't, I don't know that I've found that for myself. I think that's something that I'm still trying to look for. You know, mm. uh, Some of the things that I am doing now is taking time to be a little bit more meditative in the sense that every week I'll do a review of my week and kind of think about what I've done and um, what progress I've made or what things that I've done that I'm happy with 
and then kind of set goals for the next week. So these are the things that I've achieved. This is what I'm happy with. These are the things that I wish I could have done better. And then for this next week, these are the things that I'm going to do. And I think that's helped me a lot to be a little bit more present and to be a little bit more aware of the little wins that I have throughout the week. And, you know, at the same time, also recognizing the flaws and the faults and the things that I would like to improve so that you don't have to continue making the same mistakes again the next week. But yeah, I still, I still struggle with that balance of finding out where does the self love end and where does the self hate begin? You know, cause I do feel like you have to have a little bit of both. I mean, maybe hate's a strong word, but I do think that you have to be unhappy enough with your current situation to be able to be willing to change. Because if yeah. you're very happy with your current state, then what's the motivation? It's uh, being com- being comfortable being uncomfortable is how we mm, push through sure. that. Yeah. Right. I think uh, it lights a fire under you that you need that needs to be lit for you to get to wherever you want to be. Um, I would say even in regards to just improving yourself, even for I don't know even something as big as mental health for me, I, that it took me to hit a point where I was like, nope, okay, can't do this anymore. So. Mm-hmm. With anything, yeah, with anything at all. I don't think that hate is the right word just because hate is such a strong word and has such a lot of negative connotations. But I really don't know what the right word would be if not hate. Mm. Because there has to be an amount of self-loathing to be able to push yourself to be able to change. Because uh, at least for me, I I feel like if I'm I'm not motivated to change something, then I'm obviously not going to change it. But yeah. what is the motivator? What is the thing that is going to actually push me to the point where I say, okay, I'm not okay with this. I'm going to change. Unfortunately, because I'm, I would say because I'm in the social media realm, I have to set boundaries with myself, with what I see and who I follow. Uh, mm-hmm. It can get really easy for me to get caught up in the compare game. Um, because I'll look at one girl's body type and go, oh, I'd really like to have, you know, maybe she has really nice quads and like, okay. But then I forget I'm like five, one and my body, she's Mm -hmm. maybe like five, nine, (laughs) there's no way, you know? So yeah, yeah, body types are very different. And um, I think I personally forget that all, all the time. I Mm -hmm. did the compare game for me is my own worst enemy. Um, Mm -hmm. Someone told me that you can, you should always compare yourself to you and being better than how you were yesterday. And I think that's, true um but it's easy to say that and not do it so that's been a little bit of my journey with body dysmorphia but also because i there's a time in my life where i gained some weight and i was under the impression that i still looked great a1 but i didn't Mm -hmm. uh and i had this obscene amount of confidence and then i had lovely lovely parents that like pulled me aside and went you're beautiful we love you Mm, but maybe you know you've put on some weight maybe it's time to to like, you know, let's get to the gym. Um, yeah. And they did it in a really gentle way. But at the same time, that shatters your confidence in what you think and believe and perceive of yourself. Sure. So that was scary for me. So now I've always lived in this fear of what if I don't look as good as I think I do? Or mm-hmm. what if this confidence is fake or not real? And sure. it's just, yeah. you know, I'm not seeing things clearly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think it goes back to what I was saying before that, Mm-hmm. there is way too much weight to put on how someone looks and how someone looks relating to the value that then they carry. Yeah. So if you have this intrinsic belief that you must look a certain way to be valued or you must be beautiful to be accepted, mm-hmm. then I feel like it's inevitable that you will have some form of body image disorder whether that's comparing or uh, body dysmorphia or, you know, just plainly not liking yourself for for the way that you are, who you are, your body type, like you talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think if there's a separation between someone's worth and the way that they look in that someone is still deserving of love and still deserving of acceptance and still deserving of all the good things in life, like friends and family and happiness and all that, regardless of how they look, then I think that's more the direction that body positivity should go, where 
you have the understanding that you can still have acceptance and love and all of those things while still being a work in progress. And I think one of the best ways to get rid of body dysmorphia or to be able to manage it is to not train for a purpose. I'm mm. not training anymore to look a certain way. I don't have, currently I don't have weight goals. I don't have body composition goals. I don't have body size goals. Uh, mm. The only goals that I will, that I have are strength goals. So in terms of gaining strength or hitting certain numbers, and I have much more general goals, which are for now, just to train to be healthy, to be able to move well. So my goals are move well, be healthy, that's it. And so my training now is not something that I do to punish myself or that I do for as a means to an end. And it's super easy for me to maintain my diet. And when I say maintain my diet, I mean maintain what I eat because a diet is really not like a, a program of things that you eat. It's just yeah. everything that you put in your face. And so for me now, it's really easy just because this is my life. And it becomes super simple when I don't have any other external motivator. The only mm -hmm. thing that I'm doing is I do this because I like the way it makes me feel. And I do this because I understand that it helps me to feel better and perform better and to be better. But I don't have any real purpose in doing things for any external reasons. Mm. I like that. That's I, I had that too. I started, it's interesting, the synchronicities of what I've been thinking mm -hmm. about is like the same. Um, I started thinking, okay, well, I'm done I'm trying to aim to look a certain way. I'm just sure. going to try to just be healthy and just you know, live my life a little bit. Jeez, you know, yeah. I, was, I, I would purposely, after I'd have a cheat meal during the week, I'd go and quote, punish myself the next day by sure. doing something absolutely insane, like pushing the sled a little too much. <laughs> and then I'd be exhausted and I'd hate, my, you know, it's just not, it's a vicious cycle, but I, how did you get to the point that you are at now mentally? Like what, what prompted you to get there? Mm -hmm. Well, I've had a, um, I've had the pleasure of being able to work with a, with a really good coach, um, uh, coach and mentor. So uh, Ed Haynes from Coastal Fitness in Hong Kong has mm -hmm. been somebody that I've been working together with. And it's just interesting to be able to have somebody who's a little bit more experienced than you and has had more time you know, to be able to develop themselves. And you can bounce ideas off of each other and kind of find out what works best by having good conversations with people who yeah. know more than you. And so I think that's been one of, the, one of the biggest things is that just kind of coming to an understanding of needing to ask myself why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. So I think that was probably the biggest change is just having that conversation then and getting the encouragement to look into what my motivators are, you know? I think I, I was, um, I had a lot of goals for competition, for example, um, mm -hmm. and wanting to be the fittest in a certain region, for example, or, you know, being able to qualify for quarterfinals and the CrossFit Open, for mm -hmm. example, a lot of these different things that I had goals for or plans for. And um, just realizing that the goals that I had and the actions that I was making were completely different. So mm. while I'm saying that I want one thing that actions that I'm taking or the things that I'm doing are pushing me into a completely different direction. So I think the biggest change for me was just being able to take some time to introspect and ask myself, what is it that I want and what is it that I'm doing? And then making an adjustment between the two. Because if your goal puts you in one direction and your actions put you in a different direction, then you're basically making a decision to be inevitably unhappy. Because yeah. your goal is making a deal with yourself where until you reach that goal, you're just not going to be happy. So yeah. for me, I changed the goal. I didn't change what I was doing because I knew that to change what I was doing would have involved too much uh, sacrifice of the other things that I also value. Uh, things like business, things like family, things like relationships, you know. So I made the decision to change my goal. And then since then, I've actually been quite a lot happier. And so I'm actually at a point now where I'm making that transition again, where I have the time and I have the effort and the energy available to be able to put towards being competitive again. So that's a decision that I'm making now where I'm realigning my goals and realigning my actions. So now my actions are going to be pushed more towards the goal that I've set for myself now. So, yeah, I mean, your question of what changed, I think that's pretty much it.
just being able to look at things a little bit more clearly and understand what my actions were driving me towards and how that wasn't driving me towards my goals and then making an adjustment to change my goal to fit my actions, you know, which yeah. I think could be considered as giving up for a lot of people. But sometimes I feel like that's necessary. You have to make that shift or make that adjustment to, to do something that you that's going to at least bring you peace and happiness. And then from yeah. there, you can make whatever decision you want. Yeah, that's ultimately what, what it's about. I think uh, I, that's I think that was a really good explanation. You could have said I'm just mm-hmm. taking it all in because it's something that I personally need to work on. So by you just saying that and explain it, just like reaffirmed it for me. So mm-hmm. yeah, aligning your your why with your actions is is exactly mm-hmm. exactly it. Yeah, if you could find ways to do the things that you intrinsically want to do and not do anything you don't want to do, then inevitably you're going to find a little bit more happiness, you know, do only the things that you know, bring you joy and bring you happiness and then do absolutely zero of the things that you don't want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Within reason, obviously, if you have to go to work, then you have to go to work. (laughs) (laughs) I recently started trying to adopt that more and more. I think the less we give a shit about what people want from us or what they expect from us, and the more we just do what we want to do and what brings us peace and aligns with our needs and our wants and our goals. And I think that's mm-hmm. all that matters, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think that there's that saying about, you know, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life, which is mm-hmm. completely untrue. But I think it's a lot more of if you do what you love, then you're going to find that you can deal with all the bullshit that you have to deal with a lot easier. Yeah. because you actually love the thing that you're doing you're still going to have to work really hard at it but yeah. at least you're going to enjoy doing it and it's going to be that much easier than doing something that you absolutely hate you know and it gives you that fire and that purpose for it as well especially if you like it mm-hmm. and yeah you mm-hmm. can deal with all the bs that comes with it we, we've established the fact that most people need to have something to shoot for mm. right whether that's an extrinsic goal or an intrinsic goal either doing something yeah. because you know what makes you feel good and you enjoy doing the act and you're doing it for the pleasure of doing it, right? Yeah. Or you have an external goal. So my, I guess my next question would be, how do you feel about competition and the need to compete, whether with yourself or with other mm-hmm. people? And as a follow-up question, how would you find an outlet for competition for yourself? Those are some good questions. I like that you asked me these questions. Um, oh. <laughs> I, so competition with myself, I think is pretty heavy. These are things I've never thought about. Um, But I'd say I do compete. I do compete with myself a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't say too much, but it's very Mm -hmm. external. It's like almost like I'm competing with other women that I don't know. It's that same compare game. Mm -hmm. It's it's this idea of of if I look better than everyone else, then I'll feel good about myself, which is just, Right. outrageous and that's that's the mentality mm-hmm. i slip back into and then uh yeah like wh- wh- how would you find something that you could compete in now that isn't because yeah that, that isn't competing with other people in the sense of like you know trying to make yourself more beautiful than others so that, yeah which is just oh my goodness awful 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 um i so now it's been more along the lines of okay, hitting, hitting new weight goals, like my front squat or my just normal back squat, my deadlift, whatever, just going after those bigger compound movements and going, all right, let me push myself a little bit and compete and see if I can go farther and farther and farther. Um, or for even just, I do hit training during the week. So, um, I've decided now to get into back into boxing. I did martial arts my whole life growing up. And so I went, okay, Let's find something else. Let's just completely shift. Let's maybe go back to Muay Thai. Let's go back to doing something Mm -hmm. where it's an outlet for me of competition, but not with other, not necessarily with other people. I do think that humans need competition. You know, you are always competing, whether, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, competing for resources or, you know, even from conception, competing with all the millions of other sperm. For example, like there's always competition and that's hardwired into our DNA. And I think you need that competition to be able to, to, to thrive. And if you don't have any competitive, um, 
drive that that's kind of where you develop complacency. I feel mm -hmm. like those are the two opposite ends of the spectrum in, in a lot of ways. Um, but I think the biggest issue for me is that you have to find something to compete in that is not self-destructive. Yeah. And so if you are competing, like you said, with other people and uh, competing to try to look the best and if you look better than everybody else, then that's kind of an extrinsic factor where yeah. you can't control the way other people are and maybe someone else has better genetics or more time or more resources than you do. And so you're never gonna be able to beat that person mm -hmm. because they're just better at that game than you are. Yeah. You know, and I think maybe there's something, if you can find something else to compete in, whether it's competing against yourself with PRs and deadlifting, you know, that, that, that makes sense. But I don't know. I mean, you have to find something to compete in that's healthy and that's not going to damage you, I feel like, in a yeah, lot of ways. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I am a very naturally competitive person. So, mm -hmm. but, but with that comes a lot of ego, I think, with it is right. my ego is like, okay, I'm feeling self conscious about myself. Let me try to overcompensate a little bit. And then it falls back into that loop of, of a self-destructive competition. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel I said this to one of my friends the other day. I said, if, I feel like if much of the population had an ego death, a lot of things would be solved, but that's not feasible. So, uh, but I think we all, I think we all have it within our own way. Um, I think everything that is, I think everything that's very superficial that everyone can, I guess, competes against or compares themselves against in some way is all ego driven. So I, I don't know. Okay. But how much do you feel that ego is necessary and how much, because you said that if everybody had an ego depth, the world would be a better place to feel. Yeah. Right. Now, yeah. how much of ego do you think is necessary? A small percentage is necessary. I mean, I feel like even if you do have an ego death, your ego's not gone gone you're just kind of reborn a little bit of a different perspective you're not you're not um what's the right word you're not you're not faced with all this baggage that you're now taking out on the world um if that makes sense so i feel yes. like a little bit of ego is good um but the rest of it i think you can do away with because it gets in the way of us bettering ourselves and humbling ourselves. And like you said, if you had a big ego, if I was, com or if I had a big, big ego and I was constantly comparing myself to other people wanting to be better than them, that's very ego driven. If I didn't, mm -hmm. if I had less of that, yep. I'd kind of check myself sure. a little bit and go, Oh, hang on. I'm not like everyone else. They're, they're not going to be like me. I'm my own person. And that's kind of how I should. I think ego is what makes you who you are mm. right if you don't have ego then you have no sense of self and if you have no sense of self then you have no motivation to be or do anything mm. so i do feel like to a certain extent having a strong sense of self-worth and having a strong sense of self in general understanding who you are as a person and what your goals are as a person is necessary for you to be able to navigate life well yeah. But as far as what you're expressing, I feel like that's being like ego driven, for example, mm -hmm. or having too much ego. I don't know. Maybe it's just terminology, but no, I, think I you're, feel you're like phrasing it right. Getting yeah. rid of ego completely is just not not the way to go. I just don't imagine how that would work out. What would be the motivation then for you to change or be anything else than what you already are? That is true. That's very true. See, now I kind of want to do more research on the term ego death. Because I feel like mm. how that makes sense, you know? Let's look it up. <laughs> Just quickly Google it. What does this mean? Um, Complete loss of subjective self-identity. I love that. Oh. So, okay. If, that, if that's the case, if you're talking about a temporary thing, um, then I 100% agree. Mm. Temporary. I, sure. I, if it's temporary, then yes, I agree with that. Oh, Have you tried yeah. doing anything like... Um, uh, any like plant medicines or DMT mm -hmm. or ayahuasca or mushrooms or anything like that? I have. It's very, okay. I, I have been micro, I've been, or not currently, but I was microdosing uh, for about two months. Um, mm -hmm. I got into it because I had these 
behavioral patterns that I was stuck in from PTSD where I thought I this is ridiculous I can't keep having these exact same emotional reactions over and over again and I was in a healthy enough place where I thought all right let me give it a go and see what happens and um I did it and they just completely completely changed me I wouldn't say too drastically there's a massive difference in my emotional reactivity I'm a lot more present I'm a bit more mindful I actually don't enjoy drinking anymore I don't want to do it um I cut out caffeine so I don't know I just dove into it and uh started listening more to my body and what I needed and that's actually how body dysmorphia came up for me is one time I microdosed and I was like all right let me just microdose go work out, go get a workout in very interesting workout because because the what it does is it brings up to the surface like all these emotions that you've been sticking down inside for a while you don't really have a choice and those emotions will sit there until you have a bit of an epiphany and it clicks for you and you can mm-hmm. kind of release those emotions and deal with it and then um at that point I'm reframing the way that I'm reacting to any given emotional situation and also how I see things um but on a more permanent level as opposed to if I if I wasn't I'm just going to therapy all the time or doing EMDR um it's a bit more of a repetitive process this was a little bit more concrete it's almost like it gave my brain a blank slate and I could reconnect the neurons so yeah very interesting yeah that's very cool it's only ever something that i experience when i'm traveling to countries where it is legal and it is allowed you know but Mm -hmm. in those situations and it is something that i definitely want to explore more of because the experiences that i have had with it are pretty profound and i think the way that you put it as far as like putting a blank slate i wouldn't really say blank slate but much more the opportunities to learn more about yourself are easier to come by because Mm -hmm everything feels so much more available Yeah. where the rational or active thinking part of my brain seems to be turned off a little bit more so I can have more access to just the things that I feel as Mm. opposed to actually thinking about everything overly logically, which is what I generally tend to do or how I generally tend to spend my, spend my life just thinking about things in a much more analytical and um yeah logical framework i suppose yeah i used to be the exact same way out of all my brother still thinks that i am he makes fun of me all the time (laughs) yeah it it still made me quite perceptive of everything else that's going on around me but in a more balanced way um less Mm -hmm. chaotic there's a lot less noise that's cool (laughs) i think that's something that i'm not a very uh empathetic person i i definitely feel like I lack empathy for, for most people in most situations. I don't feel like I have the ability to connect with other people's emotions and feel things the way they feel them. Mm. Um, so I don't, I can't relate to that at all, but <laughs> I do feel much more in touch with my own emotions, you know, as a result of those types of experiences, which that's helpful at least, you know, because yeah. if you can understand yourself, then I think it makes it, gives you at least a little bit more of a framework where you can attempt to understand other people. But I definitely would not consider empathy to be one of my strong points or something that I'm particularly good at. Is that something you struggle with like your whole life or? Mm, I, I wouldn't say it's something that I've struggled with because I've only relatively recently understood that to be the case so oh. i've lived my life blissfully unaware of the fact that i lacked <laughs> empathy and so it hasn't really ever been a problem it's just uh yeah it's something that perhaps recently i've, I've realized that i'm not as empathetic as maybe most people should be or mm. would expect someone else to be you know so yeah that's interesting yeah no i mm. i can i can uh i can kind of imagine what that might be like though when you first figure that out and discover sure. something that you that you weren't aware of um it can be difficult to come to terms with it and understand it especially if you don't know that it was happening before you know right so. yeah i mean i feel like i've always been um 
interested in other people. So I've been interested in others' perspectives. I've been always interested about what makes other people tick. And so my understanding of other people always comes from asking questions or having a conversation. But as far as in my mind, what I feel empathy is would be the ability to understand the way a person is feeling just by feeling the way that they are. So you'd have a conversation with somebody, you can just emphatically understand what they're going through and you can empathize with them. They say something, you feel it for yourself. They're saying something or they're expressing an opinion or they're expressing a, a, a memory or a thought or whatever it is. And you have the ability to understand how they felt in that situation. Whereas for me, it's always been much more like, okay, well, how do you feel about that? Mm. That's the only way that I have the ability to understand is if they can tell me. And so that's something that I perhaps struggle with in relationships with people if they don't know how to communicate wow, how they feel that's tough. clearly. That's right? tough. Yeah. Mm. No, that can be that can be hard. I, I'm the very opposite of you. I am mm -hmm. incredibly empathetic to the point where it's gotten me into so much trouble that I wish mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, I wish that I'd, I wasn't empathetic in those moments because it probably would have saved me, you know. So um say more yeah. that's very interesting uh, uh, <laughs> so i uh with me it's easy to read my uh, my emotions are everywhere and i'm very expressive um sure it shouldn't be too hard for you but i yeah i would say there have been some not so great humans that i have come across in my life and my empathy mm -hmm. has kind of gotten the best of me because i i like seeing the best in people so then that logical analytical side of me I had that side but my empathy got in the way of developing that logical analytical side so I'd see a situation um instinctively go this isn't right you know based off of logic and analytical whatever so seeing a situation out being observational and then empathy would kick in and uh yeah it just wouldn't be the best scenario that put you in a position where then you because you empathize with this person or the, this then you make exceptions for them and their actions yep. and because yeah. you can understand why they're doing these things that are hurtful to you mm -hmm. a hundred okay. percent yeah i was yeah. in a like a very abusive relationship not physically <laughs> that mm -hmm. could never happen with me emotionally <laughs> Mm -hmm. emotionally yes emotionally it was in a very abusive relationship so that's where my empathy was like because you know, right. i understood so this person's pain you know right and so do you feel like you're then in a position where because you can understand why this person is acting in a certain way and why this person is doing the things that they're doing then you because you feel empathy then you're making excuses for them but then beyond that does that put you in a position where you feel like because you have the tools to do the job then you feel like you can then fix this person. Uh, back then, yes, 100%. Okay. Yeah. Now, no, no, definitely mm -hmm. not. Very what different. Changed? Oh, God. Trauma healing, you know, just mm -hmm. healed my inner child stuff and all the trauma that I went through in my young adulthood. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd say inner child healing was, was the core of it because I was acting up from a wound of not feeling good enough or fear of abandonment mm -hmm. which kind of emphasized that empathy a little bit um mm -hmm. so everything was heightened but i also found out recently that um this might be interesting to you i'm uh, a highly sensitive person which means it, i with certain emotional physical and uh, emotional physical mental stimuli i feel it a lot more intensely than other people so i feel my emotions mm -hmm more i see things in a different light there's only yeah. i guess 20 percent of the population that's like that um hmm. i was literally born this way my father told me this he was no no you've been like this since you were born it's not wow. developed um, right. i could sense the energy off of people immediately just because i picked up pick up on things that hmm. other people may not be able to pick up on just because of the external stimuli interesting yeah, yeah. very interesting yeah, I, I just had a talk with a buddy yesterday and we we're talking about um, like weird questions like happiness, you know, how do you define happiness and things like that, which is a completely different conversation. But um, one of the things that I was telling him about myself is that I just, I don't, it's not that I don't feel, it's just that I have a very 
my baseline is very stable. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have what you're saying with this big spikes of emotion and feeling. Yeah. So I definitely, I feel happiness. I feel sadness. I feel anxiety. I have all of the feelings. So luckily I'm not like clinically depressed or anything or the fact or that serial I, killer, I, you know, you never know. Yeah. Or that, um, <laughs> You know, lack of empathy, that's one box tick. But uh, I feel, I still have all of the feelings and I, I'm very, I feel lucky that I have the opportunity to experience all of those things. But it's not that it's dampened, it's just that my baseline seems to be very, very regular. So I'll just wake up every morning and I just feel the same. Like I'm not mm. there, I very rarely have off days and I very rarely have incredible, wonderful days. They're all just oh, wow. days, you know what I mean? That's interesting. And so no, within yeah. those days, I'll still have, plenty of opportunities for happiness and plenty of opportunities for gratefulness. And, you know, I still experience life probably very similar to the way other people do, but it's just not as the highs are not as high and the lows are definitely not as low. If mm. that makes any sense. And yeah, you know? no, it makes perfect sense. I completely mm. get it. I don't know what that's like, but I completely get it. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. I don't think, I think you're the first person I've met that's like that. Or I might have met people that's like that. And I just, I just didn't know because I didn't have this conversation with them. But Right, um, yeah. Yeah. There's got to be more of us out there. There, had, sure. there. You're not alone. I know you're not alone. There's more, <laughs> there's more out there, I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, you could just you could be a normal person. There, that's probably what like normal people feel like, to be honest. Right, yeah, it could be. Because, I mean, you were saying there's like 20% of the population that are highly sensitive, right? So I don't mm -hmm. imagine that everybody experiences life that way. You know, I mean, yeah. I, know, I know people personally who are depressive and they, they, their days are all very much similar, but then it just tends towards the negative. Mine is just pretty much every day is the same, but it always tends towards the positive. Like I don't, I very rarely wake up feeling shit. I always wake up and I'm like, great, another day. And that's just, that's just my life. Like I don't, I I'm feel like very you're rarely waking up and like amazing, you know, it's just, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I feel like that's not, I feel like you're just a normal person. I'll be honest. Sure. I don't think that's, I don't think that's ab abnormal in any way. I think that's mm -hmm. maybe what a healthy brain would be, you know? Maybe. Let's see. Let's leave that to the professional to, to be able yeah. to analyze that. <laughs> I'm not a clinical professional. No, no idea. No yeah. clue. Well, no. thank you for having me on. Well, a, thank you for a great conversation. On. Yeah, it was actually one of the most cerebral conversations I've had <laughs> in a long time. You challenged my brain and I was like, I like this. No one does this. Yeah, well, I appreciate you. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, you have to go through the eye of the storm to see the clear horizon ahead. Thanks so much, guys, and I'll see you next week.